Welcome to ANN in depth. Today I am talking to Ivan about chaplaincy. Ivan, thank you for joining me. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you for the invitation. Excellent. We have a conversation now about chaplaincy. You were a chaplain at a hospital for 16 years, you said. That is correct. 16 years at Advent Health. What was that like? Wow. <laughs> Never a dull moment when you're a chaplain. Um, you are with people in their best and in their worst. Best as in births, I presume. Yes, yeah. Time of birth, but also in the worst when they're dying or when the families are going through very difficult times. So um, you are there to support the families. You're there to support the patients. You're there to support the employees in the hospital. It's, it's, it's a lot of work. <laughs> I tell you that much. So chaplaincy is also to the, to the staff, not just to the patients. Yes, yes, indeed. And, and, and the world after COVID has become more about the staff than it was about the patients. Tell me more about that. Well, um, you probably are familiar with um, <clears throat> something that up, up until now was only happening with soldiers returning from, from war. They had PTSD and moral injury and all that. Now we are finding healthcare workers who are going through PTSD, moral injury. Um, the numbers in suicide attempts are growing exponentially among healthcare workers after COVID. Why is that? Well, I think first of all, this I'm 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 going to share with you what I believe is the case. Sure. And, and there has to be a lot of studies that have that have to come out. But in my case, I believe that one of the reasons why this is happening is um, we didn't know a lot or we didn't know anything about COVID when we started having to deal with COVID. And you remember that in the beginning of this whole pandemic, most of the people that ended up going to the hospital ended up dying. And uh, <clears throat> because we didn't know about, about what was going on, we didn't know how, what, what were the precautions that needed to be taken and all that, employees had to be at bedside when people were dying. And that's a moment when usually families would be surrounding the bed and, and many times they were using FaceTime or phones and, and that gave them a moral injury to the employees, to the, to the staff. Add to that the fact that they had to be separated from their own families during this whole thing. You know, they would be in the hospital taking care of a patient for 12 hours and then they would come home and they would literally have to have a staging place when they came into their house so that where they could take all their clothes and, and get completely um, cleaned, if you will, and so there was, there was that separation. Human touch became something that we didn't do very much, you know, in the age of social distancing and all that. So all that added up to seeing so many people die. Um, that, that will definitely cause some psychological damage. Hmm. Very traumatic indeed. Okay, how how do you go about, does the hospital chaplaincy team visit regularly the staff or only when the staff calls? And how do you handle different faiths? Oh, that's, that's a very interesting question. Um, love it, by the way, love it. Because it's part of my own dissertation when I did my work in my doctoral work. Um, <clears throat> you see, usually there, there, there have been up to um, I want to say about three models of chaplaincy ministry. Um, in my dissertation, I focus on two models, which I, by the way, I did it right in the middle of the pandemic. Mm. Um, one model is what is called the traditional model of chaplaincy. For a long time, chaplains responded when they were called or they responded when there was a spiritual care consult generated. I'm talking in the hospital setting. Um, but during the pandemic and maybe a little bit before the pandemic, 
Some people thought that maybe we could change the way chaplains work in the hospital, and rather than being assigned a certain number of bed, they were assigned units. Okay. So in a hospital where you have five floors, for example, you would have a chaplain that is for the fifth floor. That's his unit or her unit, and they are the pastor for that unit. And they're part of everything that happens in the unit. The model is called the embedded chaplain model, using the model of the army of the United States, where they, the chaplain is embedded with the unit that they provide ministry to. So they're the pastors for that group of people. Now imagine this. Before, when you had the traditional chaplain model, if you will, um, a nurse came into your room and they were visiting with you and they noticed there was something with you and you probably need to have a chaplain come visit with you. So the nurse would tell you, you know what, Sam, I think you need to see the chaplain. I'm going to put a consult and the chaplain will come in the next 24 hours to see you. That's a traditional model. Okay, got it. But with the new model, with the embedded chaplain model, she would go, Sam, I see that you need some help. You know, our chaplain has his office right here, right across the hallway. Let me go get him for you. Okay, so it's more immediate uh, and it's less of customer service. You know, I need this, please help me. Uh -huh. And it's more... Interestingly that you... Very interesting that you use the word customer service because in, this is... Uh, you can take... You can say I'm passionate about all this. Good. This you should is, be. I mean, if you're beautiful. not, who's it going to be, right? <laughs> yeah, so. this is beautiful. You can say I'm passionate about this because starting in 2008... Here in the United States, you may remember that thing that is called Obamacare mm -hmm. is actually the Affordable Care Act. That's mm. the name of that. In the Affordable Care Act, Medicare decided that, you know, uh, let me let me see if I can explain it quickly. <laughs> Take your time. This uh, is in depth. You, you uh, go for it. Okay, good. Well, before 2008... If you got sick and you went to the emergency department because you had chest pains, for example, mm. um, the uh, Medicare would pay the hospital the services they provided you just as long as they, in the first 30 minutes, they gave you uh, an aspirin and they did an EKG on you, an electrocardiogram. As long as the hospital proved to Medicare that they had done that to you in the first 30 minutes, they would get 100% of their reimbursement. But in 2008, with the introduction of the Affordable Care Act, they did something that I think it's the best thing they could have ever done. Mm. They said, we are going to continue to pay back the hospital for giving you the aspirin and the EKG, but we're going to give them only 60% for that. The other 40% is how they treat you while they give you that. And we're going to measure that through a survey that is called HCAPS. Mm. That survey has 28 questions. And this is the interesting thing. Medicare or CMS, which is Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, decided that anything that you get, anything other than a five in the, that survey, that's failure. So you could have gotten a four from one to five. If you got a four, that's a failure. You don't get the reimbursement. Wow. In those 28 questions, there is one question, question number 21, which was the center for my research. Degree to which the hospital staff address your spiritual and emotional needs. My goodness. And that question, along with... Willingness to recommend, how willing are you to recommend this hospital to your family and friends became the two most important questions to identify that 40% reimbursement. So imagine how things are now. That was an excellent encouragement for chaplaincy uh, right there. Traditionally, Adventists have been pioneers of holistic health. Indeed, the idea that you 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 mm -hmm. you care for the whole person, not mm -hmm. just for yeah yeah for their for their physical needs. Now it seems that the world has been listening, mm -hmm. um, and there is even pressure from the government. I had no idea mm -hmm. for chaplaincy to be an important part of hospitals. Well, they never thought about chaplaincy in the beginning. 
Mm-hmm. They were just talking about emotional and emotional and spiritual needs. But you know, if you talk about spiritual needs, you're talking about chaplains. I mean, it's the two things go hand in hand, right? Well, you you're, you're ignoring not quite. part of the question. Because remember, the question is not the degree to which the hospital chaplain address your spiritual and emotional needs. Mm-hmm. Is the degree to which the hospital staff address your spiritual and oh, emotional needs. Oh, that's, that's a good nuance there. So it's not just the chaplain. It's all staff. And you see, the, the, the question is really, and when you get in in-depth and you start analyzing all the nuances and everything on that, what the question is really asking is the degree to which you're being treated with compassion. Hmm. Now, I, I have to get there because that's exactly what Sister White talked about when she began to talk when we began having sanatoriums. When we started our health ministries exactly. back in the 1800s. Exactly, exactly. It was all about sharing the compassion of Christ. Sharing hmm. that beautiful compassion of Christ. And what is interesting is that what I what I was able to do through my my research is I went back and I I I compared scores for those questions for five years in a row. For which hospitals? Two hospitals. Okay. One that had the traditional chaplain model, and another one that had the embedded chaplain model. Fantastic methodology. You can, yeah, okay. <laughs> and so I I ran the numbers and I discovered that the hospital that had the embedded chaplain model, they affected not only the perception of spiritual care, but they affected the perception of compassionate care with all the other 28 questions. There was a direct correlation. Whereas the chaplain, the hospital with the traditional chaplain model, there was no correlation. It seemed as if there was no chaplains although the chaplains were visiting with patients and all that. How much do you think that is a result of the growth in hospital size? Because when you talk about the traditional chap, we've had chaplains for 2,000 years now. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's, Christians were <laughs> some of the first to invent mm-hmm. uh, the idea of spiritual care and chaplaincy. Mm-hmm. And hospitals have become very large only recently. Mm-hmm. You, you, 200 years ago, you didn't have five floors of a hospital. Mm-hmm. Um, so it seems to me that the traditional model mm-hmm. was already close to what you're describing now because the entire hospital perhaps was a little larger than a unit is today. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, if, did you think about that process or not really? Well, <laughs> Is what, it the number of people? Or is it the speciality? What, what is it exactly? I think it's the number of people. Um, and having the same people. Mm-hmm. But here's the thing. Um, I even had to go into that when I was doing my research because, all right, what defines the size of a hospital? What makes a hospital a big hospital? What makes a hospital a small hospital? Mm. Statistically speaking, it has been accepted that a hospital that has 400 beds or more is a large hospital. Sure. And a hospital that has less than 400 beds, it's a small hospital. Mm-hmm. Interestingly enough, excuse me, interestingly enough, hospitals that are considered large in the United States have 92% of them have chaplains, full-time chaplains. But what we don't know, and maybe that's a a study that needs to happen, is how many chaplains they have. Because many, many of those hospitals, for 400 patients, they have one chaplain, which is not the right ratio. I see. What was interesting about my study is that although I studied two hospitals, one, the one that had the traditional chaplain model was a small hospital, and the one that had the embedded chaplain model was a large hospital, one of the things that I controlled was the patient to chaplain ratio. ratio. Mm-hmm. So although they were two different sizes of hospital, they had the same ratio. Got it. Okay, that's important. Yes. Fascinating stuff. Okay, good. Let's leave the hospital. Okay. And yeah. go into other areas of chaplaincy. Yes, indeed. Another area that we think of is are the armed forces. 
Military, yes. Have the military always had chaplains in the last hundreds, thousands of years, or is this a new phenomenon? Well, hundreds, thousands of years, no. The chaplains because we've had armies. Yeah, we've had we've the beginning had armies, of humanity yeah. almost. And 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 if you will, the term chaplain goes all the way to the Middle Ages, mm. to the Crusades. Okay, that's the first of the understanding that we have of what we understand now as a chaplain. You also, before before I get into that, don't let me forget, please, Sam, because I, I get, you know, I get, um, I get encouraged and I start jumping from one place to the other. But before I get into talking about that, remember that in the Bible, in the Old Testament, the ones who administered health were the priests. I see. Remember that? Yes, I do. All right. Having said that, let's come back to this. In the Middle Ages, when we are when the the world is going into the Crusades, that's when for the first time we find some sort of chaplain. What would happen was that when the soldiers were going into the Crusades, many of them, remember this is uh, this is the time when the Roman Catholic Church is predominant. Mm -hmm. Many of them are not baptized and they're going on a holy war. So that's one of the reasons why that sprinkling of water thing, because mm. they would take a priest that would sprinkle water on them as they were going through. So they would go to the Crusades baptized. Oh, I see. The other yeah. thing that happened is Martin of, Martin of Tor, uh, I forgot. I, I remember the name was Marty, Martin. Mm. And he was a soldier. And he saw a beggar next to the road and he took his cape and broke it in half because the beggar was very cold. cold. Mm. And so out of that, Martin became a holy man and the half of his uh, rope. cape, his mm -hmm. rope, became part of something that was kept in a capella. Mm -hmm. And those who kept that ca cape were called capellanos, mm. which is cap chaplain. Now that starts to make sense. That's when this whole thing comes. Mm. Now, I want to jump ahead in time because I think this is important, especially where we are. We are in 1774 here in the United States. You know, the Ben Franklin... Uh, Alexander Hamilton. New Republic. Yeah, the New mm. Republic. They are now calling on George Washington to lead the army so that they can fight against the English mm -hmm. and they could fight for the freedom of the United States, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then they choose Washington to be the general of the first uh, army here. Yeah. And they had what they called the Continental um, Legislature, the Continental Congress. George Washington stands in front of the Continental uh, Congress and says to them, I will accept the responsibility to be the general for the Continental Army only if you appoint me a chaplain and if you appoint me a secretary. Hmm. So from the very beginning of the United States nation, they had chaplains in the military. That's fascinating. Where did he get the idea from? I would, I would know? think, I, uh, I, don't, I don't know, but I would think that it was because of his experience in, in the armies that he was before that he pre belonged to before. So that was something that already existed, but he prioritized it. In, he um, made it a, he made it a, a, a point. That's the reason why we now have a chaplain in the Senate and a chaplain in Capitol Hill in the in the legislature. Mm. Yeah, and I, we interviewed um, Dr. Barry Black for this. Barry Black, yeah, yeah. For this podcast, is the chaplain of the Senate. He's US the Senate. chaplain of the U.S. Senate, correct? So, how difficult is it to be a chaplain? of the armed forces? <clears throat> well, 
to be a chaplain in the Seventh Day Adventist Church. Let me answer first from sure. the perspective of the Seventh Day Adventist Church. To be a chaplain in the Seventh Day Adventist Church, you first have to be a pastor. That's the first thing you need to do. You first have to be a pastor because chaplaincy is a specialty of ministry. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> the United States Armed Forces have a certain list of requirements that they have. There is a there is an organization called NICMAF, National Conference of Ministry to the Armed Forces, of which we are members. I mm -hmm. am a member. I represent the Seventh Day Adventist Church worldwide in NICMAF. We meet every year in January, and at that time we meet with the chiefs of chaplains of every one of the areas of the army here in the United States. Okay, Air Force, Navy, and Army. Uh, so the chief Guards. chaplain of each. Of, of each, each branch. branch. Mm -hmm. And so when we sit down with them, they share with us what are the requirements that they have. And right now, these are the requirements. You have to have you have to be a pastor. You have to have at least two years of pastoral experience. Having pastored mm -hmm. a church or something. Yeah, yeah. You have to have a master's of divinity. Mm. 72 semester hours or more. You also have to pass the medical tests and the medical, uh, yeah, the medical test to be a to to be in the military altogether. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you also, once the church gives you what is known as the endorsement. Endorsement is simply a letter that we sign saying he's all right. Sam, she's all right. Sam is authorized to be the chaplain. Mm -hmm. You need to have credentials, and you need to have th th those things. And then once that happens, you go to the training. The, actually, each one of the branches have their own chaplaincy, chaplaincy, cool, chaplaincy schools. Excellent. The Air Force Chaplaincy School, the Navy Chaplaincy School, and the Army Chaplaincy School. And you go there. Uh, it's normally a 6 to 12 week training that you have to go through. And then you get assigned either in the Army, Navy, or Air Force to the places where you need to go. Now you have two choices. You can be a reserves chaplain, which means you are required to go one weekend a month and okay. minister to either the battalion if you're in the army or you know the ship if you're in the navy or the the Air Force base if you're in the Air Force. Which is a unit. That's what you were referring to mm -hmm. earlier, that mm -hmm. hospitals are now adapting uh -huh. to that reality. Exactly. Okay? Or you can be um, an active duty chaplain. We do have active duty chaplains and we have, we have reserves chaplains. Active have, duty is basically full-time. Let's full go. Full-time, yes. Mm -hmm. Full-time. And when that unit is deployed, the chaplains, the chaplain... Uh, goes with them. If you're in the army, yes. If you're in the navy, you may not. Mm. You may not. Navy or air force, you may end up being asked to stay behind to support the families, or you may be asked to go with them on the ships. I there see. are chaplains that have been assigned to the ships. Mm -hmm. So whoever's in that ship, that's his. That's yeah, his church. That's his church, and you know, you may be in a destroyer with 500 you know seamen and women and that's your church that's your people and you're living together with them for 6 months yeah got it out there on the on the sea the, the generally people go into ministry because they want to save lives they want people to be free they want people to follow the the gospel they want people to be peaceful mm -hmm. but now you're a chaplain mm -hmm. and you find yourself in the middle of of war mm -hmm. sometimes mm -hmm. how how does a chaplain reconcile their desire for peace mm -hmm. while supporting the men and women who are in battle mm. somewhere well first of all you have to understand that battle is is a reality i mean even from heaven itself battle was a reality in heaven when satan uh decided to rebel against god <clears throat> what i have seen our chaplains do in the military is that 
their job is to provide spiritual support and to provide ministry to those who are going. None of our chaplains are going to war. By the way, they're the only people in the army, in the armed forces here in the United States and everywhere in the world because it is something that has been done in... Um, uh, what's that document that they keep talking about uh, that rules wars and, and the, 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 the Gibraltar... I forgot the name of that. It'll, it'll come to me in a minute, but... Okay. <clears throat> But it is some treaty somewhere. Yeah, mm -hmm. some treaty somewhere that says that no chaplain in any army is to be carrying weapons. I didn't know that. Yeah, they're the only ones, by the way. You remember the story of Desmond Doss? I do remember the well, story. Well, Desmond, Desmond Doss was the first and only medic that was granted permission not to carry weapons. After that, the United States uh, government decided. That will never happen again. Okay? Wow. So he was the only one that was ever granted permission to do that. But it is also stipulated that the chaplains are the only ones that are not to carry weapons. Their weapons are the Bible. Interesting. Huh. Okay? That's, that's the sword. <laughs> uh -huh. That's their sword. Uh -huh. Then what they do is they provide ministry to the soldiers who go into battle which is, by the way, part of the position of the church because the position of the church in the last part of the official statement, it clearly indicates that our position is not binding and that if someone chooses or is forced to go into military service where they have to bear arms, our recommendation is not to bear arms. Our position is that we are non-combatants. But there are some people that are forced into it and or others the, choose to it. Or the, others choose do, to do it. The position says, if someone chooses to do it, our responsibility is to support them spiritually. Okay. So we're not taking responsibility for what they do, nor do we encourage that, but we do care for them spiritually because that's our job. The interesting thing, um, during the month of October, dur uh, we had our worship services here at the General Conference were led by chaplains, most of them. And I invited Chaplain Tiff Hardy. Chaplain Tiff Hardy is a VA chaplain here in the, in the area, but he was also a combat chaplain during the first war, Iraq war. Okay. And he was sharing with us stories of meeting with the soldiers right before they went into battle hmm. and praying with them all, but also having the chance to pray with those prisoners that were coming back huh. and sharing with them Bible studies and, 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 and knowledge of the word of God and praying with them. So what you see now is a chaplain that is providing a spiritual presence, a spiritual influence in the place where none of us would go. I see. Yeah. That's very special. So we talked about the complexities in a hospital. Uh -huh. We talked about the complexities to the chaplain in the armed forces. Where else do we find chaplains? Oh, jeez. Um, you have chaplains that are supporting the fire department. We have, we have chaplains that are dedicated in the state of California only. You know, with all those, those fires and people losing their homes and all that, we have chaplains that go out there when people lose their homes hmm. and support them. We have, um, for example, uh, you, have you ever seen a uh, NASCAR race? Mm -hmm. Did you know that a NASCAR race always begins with a prayer? No, I did not. Yeah. And there's a Seventh-day Adventist pastor who does that prayer because he's the chaplain for NASCAR. Is that right? Uh-huh. <laughs> I did not know that. Cool. Um, we have chaplains in our schools. We have chaplains in universities. We also have chaplains. We have chaplains in our universities, but we also have chaplains in non-Adventist university. We have a Seventh-day Adventist chaplain in Harvard University. We have a Seventh-day Adventist chaplain in... Uh, um, Columbia University in New York and Stanford in 
in um, California. How do chaplains deal with different religions? Well, that's, that's also a very interesting and powerful question. Because as I have learned in my chaplaincy training, number one, the number one rule in ministry for me is that it's not about me. So I will find people that will come to me with the most unusual requests, okay? And uh, I will always respond to the unusual or the usual requests. It doesn't matter what they, what they are. I will always respond by analyzing inside of me how does that relate to my own identity as a Seventh-day Adventist pastor because I am a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. Mm -hmm. That does not change. And so when somebody asks me for something that goes against my identity as a Seventh-day Adventist pastor, what I do is I look for someone who can provide for them what I cannot provide. Give me an example of what that could be. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, most of my ministry was in the hospital, so sure, my sure. example would yeah, come yeah. from a hospital experience. I was I was a chaplain at Celebration Health in Orlando, mm -hmm. and I get called in the middle of the night. This young lady just gave birth to a stillborn baby, and she is not allowing anyone to touch the baby until somebody comes and baptizes the baby. Okay, that's a deep example. <laughs> I get there. I learned another lesson in chaplaincy that perhaps our listeners can use because one thing I understand is behind every behavior, there's always a story. Mm -hmm. And is it, it is in that story where you find the opportunity for ministry. So don't, don't jump in. Don't jump Just in. Ask, no, ask. no, no, no. Yeah. Sit down and ask. What's going on? What's happening? Tell me more. Why do you not want anybody to touch the baby? And came to realize that she's a Catholic. And in her mind, if the baby is not baptized, God is not going to recognize her. Now, my conundrum comes when I call the priest. Because I told you, I can call someone who would do for her what I cannot do. So I called the local priest. And the priest says, I'm not coming. That baby's dead. <laughs> ay, 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 ay. But then I sat down and I, I read a little bit about the official position of the Catholic Church regarding this matter. And it turns out that for the Catholics, anyone, as long as they say in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, anyone can baptize anyone. I am not going to baptize the baby because I'm a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. I don't believe in that. But there was a Catholic nurse there that was more than willing to come into that room, pour some water in the baby's forehead, and say in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Hmm. And that wasn't the moment to have a Bible study about... That wasn't this, the moment the, for me to, ta truth. to tell her, you know, this is the... the, the I, I, I mean, would she understand the state of the death if I started talking to her about that? Or right. baptism. Or baptism. those are the two doctrines. Exactly. At that moment, what she needs is somebody to pour some water in the baby. I am not going to do it. Notice. I am not going to do it because mm -hmm. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. And some chaplains will go, oh, Ivan, you're crazy. Because I know some Seventh-day Adventist chaplains who have poured the water on the baby. Who would do it. Yeah, who would do it. That will, be, that will bring great confusion later if she ever discovers the truth. You got me. You got it. That's the reason why whenever I have found some chaplains who have done that, I pull them aside. And the question I ask is, you want to tell me, how do you justify theological what you, theologically what you just did? Oh, well, it's not about me. Yes, it's not about you. But I think you're compromising. Mm-hmm. And I don't believe in compromise. Got it. So the nurse came, poured some water in the baby's forehead. We prayed. And everything was resolved. Well, in terms of the conflict, not in terms of her healing. Ex is there 
Is there follow-up if she wants afterwards? So that it depends on your health plan? No, <laughs> that's a good question. No, the health plan doesn't, um, doesn't preclude the patient from seeking help mm -hmm. after that. If the patient wants to get some more help from the chaplains, if they want to have conversations, some hospitals have grief recovery groups that meet after that and families come and, com and talk about these things. Um, some churches also. We at Florida Hospital at the time, now Advent Health, we had at the time what was called the, the Ministry of Nurture. Mm -hmm. And the Ministry of Nurture was connecting some lay people that were very caring and very loving to these families and providing them a, an opportunity to find ways to overcome this horrendous pain they're going through. Yeah, wow. How many chaplains do we have in the world? Do we know? Um, well, I can tell you that the chaplains that I have registered in the ACM database is about 1,600. That's a lot. It's about 4%, 3% of our workforce, our pastors. Mm -hmm. that's, that's and the majority of them are not even working for the church. Correct. They're working, they're working in, in other environments. Mm -hmm. um, I have a friend who is one of the chaplains here at Children's Hospital in, um, in D.C., and uh -huh. it seems like a fascinating job. Well, what other considerations would you give and, and, and what would you say to young people that are thinking of becoming chaplains? Oh, that's a good question. And, and the answer to that is very simple. First, if I was able to, be a cha to become a chaplain, anybody can do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you see, where, where there's a will, there's a way. A lot of people think about all the requirements that you have to follow in order to become a chaplain. Um, and they look at that and they go, oh, that's too much. Yeah, it is, too, it is a lot, but you can do it. Anyone can do it. I'll give you an example. Um, I'm working at the hospital as a chaplain and I get a phone call from the director of chaplaincy ministries in Orlando, the, okay. the director of the hospital. Yeah. Jay Perez is his name. Hmm. Jay calls me and says, Ivan, I have this lady here. She wants to be a chaplain. Okay. And she's Latina. And I know you need people who speak Spanish in Kissimmee. Mm -hmm. So he Orlando. sends her to me. And she comes. She comes. This is a woman who used to be a nutritionist in the army. Okay. She is retired. So by the time she comes to me, she's 72 years old. 72-year-old wants to become a chaplain. She wants to become a chaplain. Okay. And I tell her, well, you need to do a master's. You need to get a master's of divinity. <laughs> you need to get four units of clinical pastoral education. She went like, okay. When she was 76, she came back, gave me the, the diploma for a master's, and here's my four units of CPE. Oh, my goodness, Ivan. This is one determined woman. Yeah, and she started working with us, and she was just so in tune to that and to the work that she was doing. She was only doing per diem mm -hmm. work, so she wasn't working for us all so the time. So she would come here and there. She would when come needed. when we needed her. Yeah, yeah. But she was so determined, and and she had so much passion for this that one day she comes to me and says, "Ivan, I think I want to do a PhD." <laughs> so she went to Loyola University and got a PhD in chaplaincy. And by now she's in her 80s, right? Just, Late 70s. Just last July, she retired at 87 years old. Oh, my God. Completely goodness. retired from chaplaincy. What a heroic woman. It's never too late. Anyone can do it. If you put your heart to it, you can do it. But you see, the thing is, there are a lot of people out there who want to provide some sort of chaplaincy training as a, as a backdoor into ministry. No, you need to be a pastor first. You need to be a pastor first. You need yeah. to be a pastor. And by the way, that's also the reason why we need to have these conversations uh -huh. that you and I are having. And we need people to hear this. Mm -hmm. Because, um, for example, I'm an ordained pastor. And I function as a chaplain. 
I didn't have to have another ordination as a chaplain. Right. One ordination. Enough. That's enough. The same thing for a female pastor who is going to be commissioned. One commissioning. Same. You don't need, but Done. I know of some conferences here in the United States who have asked their chaplains who have been commissioned as chaplains when they move into cha into pastoral ministry, we have to commission you again because you're not a real pastor. No, we still have, we, we still have that idea. I see. Okay. Look, uh, it's possible that many pastors and chaplains are listening to you in mm -hmm. this interview. Okay. In this podcast. Ivan, I would like you to look at this camera over here. Okay. And share a few words of encouragement with them. Okay. And then if you could pray for them, please. Ah, that'll be an honor. That'll be an honor. All right. First. I'm going to share with you a story. A story I heard from a female chaplain that taught me the biggest lesson about ministry. It doesn't matter if you're in a church setting, if you're in a conference or in an office, or if you're a chaplain. I want you to hear this story. She had a, a four-year-old bo four boy who came one afternoon and said to mom, Mommy, I want to help you in the kitchen. So mommy said, of course, I'm going to let you help me. So she went and got a chair and got a couple of plastic cups and a, plas a couple of plastic silverware. And he started to play with the water, playing that he was helping mommy. He got water and soap all over himself, all over everything in the kitchen. And then about an hour and a half later, turned to mom and said, mom, I'm done, I'm tired. <laughs> so mom took him, went to the bathroom, bathed him, and then went and put him down and he fell asleep. Mom then had to come back to the kitchen and clean up everything after allowing her four-year-old to help. And as she was cleaning up, she said to me, Ivan, that's when I heard. And looked up into the heaven and said, I see it now. You let me help you, God. You let me help you. And then you have to come after me <laughs> and fix everything I broke down or everything, all the mess that I created. I want you, my dear friend, that are listening to me right now, remember, God is simply letting you play with the water and the soap. Afterwards, he has to come and clean up the, after you and after me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Thank you so much for trusting me, a feeble human being, and saying, you know what? I'm going to trust you. Go help me. Go be a chaplain in a hospital. Go be a chaplain in a, in a base. Go be a chaplain in a police department or a fire department or in a jail. I need you to go be my minister there. I need you to go be the pastor in that church. And then you go after us and you clean up after the mess we create. But you look at us with loving eyes and you say, you see, my friend, you see, I love you so much that I want you to continue to help me. It's okay. Whatever you do, I will fix it. I will complete it. Complete it. Father, please remind us every day that we do what we do just because you allow us to do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Ivan, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Sam. It was a pleasure. It, it, was, it was very enjoyable, this conversation. Thank you. Awesome. I, I learned a lot. Uh, I hope you have learned a lot too. Uh, thank you for joining us here at ANN In Depth. Don't forget to subscribe or follow this podcast on YouTube, po uh, Spotify, iTunes, wherever it is that you listen to podcasts. And I want you to know that we appreciate every minute that you spend with us. Uh, thank you for following us every week. And uh, I hope that you share this with your chaplains or your pastors. And I'll see you next week. <laughs>